your spirit is one with the Lord, and there's no evil in there, amen, because um, the spirit of God is not going to dwell with demonic oppression inside of your spirit, man, that you're holy in that place, but your mind, your will, your emotions, how you think, how you process, you know, the soulish part of you, that's where you have some issues. The soulish part of you is where you struggle with strongholds and um, sin iniquities and curses and cycles and wrong ways of thinking, uh, right? Emotional damage is all in the soul. Many people have soul wounds, and so with cleansing, it's inner healing and deliverance, okay? It's a cleaning out that which is unlike the nature of Jesus. And so many people are wounded in the soul, in a fractured, wounded soul, all right, that area right there, if that does not get healed, that is a place where uh, demons can attach themselves to, and so they get in through that, and much of us uh, in our foundation, it needs to be fixed. Our foundation is faulty, and so we begin to build. We learn about Christ. We begin to grow as a child of the kingdom and all of that, but if I have some cracked places in my foundation, I have some unhealed soul wounds, I have some trauma, I have some abuse, I, I open the door to the occult and I have, you know, or sexual immorality and I have unclean spirits all up in my soul someplace, those things are going to affect how you grow as a child of God. And so we need God to fix faulty foundations. Amen. And he's going to do that this weekend. He's going to uproot some things in probably some areas that you didn't, you were not aware of. And so even as we um, release the word of God, there can be hidden things within us, hidden things that we are unaware of that keep causing us to cycle or cause us to be angry. And we don't know why we're angry. We can be around a certain type of people or something happened to us and we have triggers. We have areas where, you know, that thing just pushes our button, as we say, or, you know, those kind of things. Or maybe, um, maybe you cycle with addictions. You do pretty good for a few weeks and then, boom, you find yourself struggling and wanting to go back. So there's many reasons for that. And so I believe after this weekend that... Uh, when Jesus puts his finger on that, because that's what he does, he will deliver you from the things that snare you. Amen. Amen. And so um, Hebrews, Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, because we're talking about uh, we're going to talk about bloodline and just jump right in tonight. And so it says for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two edged sword and piercing as far as a division of soul and spirit of both joints and the marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And so the writer, when you, when you read this, it says that the word goes down into the heart. So when Jesus speaks of the heart, he's speaking of the soul man. Okay. He goes down into the heart, the soul deep into the joints and the marrow Okay, and we know marrow, when we talk about the marrow, you th always think of blood, right? And it's true. It is the interior cavities of the bones as a major site of blood cell production. So that won't be in your white book, but that's in the handbook, okay? And so um, the word of God, we know Jesus is the word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So he's able to see down into your generations. He's able to see down into the heart, the soul, and so in this place, when you're talking about the soul man, the blood line, because life of the flesh is in the blood. And so you are who you are because of a blood line. And so you were with the Father in heaven, okay? He, he, you're a created spirit. He put you in. When he sent you to the earth, he put you in a body suit. He put you in a blood line. He released you into the earth. All right, because Ephesians says we were in him before the foundation of the world. And so I believe we were in him, and I believe he chose what you're looking at. He chose that. He loves nations, right? And so he puts you in a bloodline. He puts you down in there. And so you're born into a sin nature. And so you're taught things by your family, 
uh, by either by what they've put in you or what was in them, they're going to put in you. And so children learn from their parents. But there's a lot of things, how you look and how you think. Um, strongholds in your thinking. It comes from a bloodline. And so we know that the marrow is the interior cavities. We said that. So this is where the iniquity, and we're going to talk about and read some scriptures about iniquity. This is where iniquity is rooted in our spiritual DNA, and it works its evil through our spiritual and physical health. And so when it says there is no creature hidden from his sight, that word creature is a Greek word which means there's no building, there's no formation, there's no ordinance, which ordinance speaks of legal rights. And so in the spirit realm this weekend, you will hear us pray breaking contracts and covenants and uh, spiritual assignments and all of those things against you, okay, that could have been planned long before you were in the earth. We see it all the time. And so things that your ancestors did, things in the generational bloodline that are still living in the blood, it could be when it says formation, it could be some altar. It could be something inside of you that you don't know that they did before you got here, right? Before your, uh, whatever your ancestors did, those things is generational repentance. There's an identificational repentance that we do. Things we're aware of, things we know, if we got in the occult or we, you know, did some things that we shouldn't have done and God has showed us, yes, we're going to renounce and repent of those things, but there are hidden things that you know nothing about, but Jesus said that you know a tree by its fruit. And so you can be manifesting fruit in your life that something that you didn't open up, but someone else did. And it's unconfessed. It's undealt with. It's spirits that have been hiding, familiar spirits, things that have been hiding within. And so it means um, also it means, of course, creature. And so these creatures can be bloodline familiar spirits. They can be infirmity spirits. And so, you know, when you go in, they ask you what is in your family's history. And so if your grandmother had diabetes, then what are they going to do? If you're not feeling well, they're going to check you for diabetes. It's the same principle, people of God, as it is in the natural, so it is in the spirit. And so we have to get understanding about these things. And so altars of evil, you could have had... Uh, your ancestors could have murdered people and all of those things, you know. And so there are contracts in that. Demons don't die. You got to understand that. It's a spiritual world. To deny the spirit world of darkness, we would have to deny the spirit of God, the, the spirit of light. Because there's two kingdoms. There's a spirit of light and the spirit of darkness. Amen. And so you can't deny the other side, apparently, because when we get saved... And we get born again, and even when we get filled with the Holy Spirit, we still got some issues. We still have some behaviors that we try and crucify. Come on, we read our Bible, we pray, we fast, we try all of these things, and, and that thing is still ever-present. And so we need some deliverance from something within us. Right? And so thank God that Jesus still does that today. And so these things are, are legal accusations in the realm of the spirit. They speak out against us in the spirit realm, but in our blood. The blood speaks. Okay? That's how you hear the accuser. Yes, he can be outward and he can speak to you. He can. He can oppress you, but many times we're hearing him inside. If we have a strong spirit of rejection in us or fear, all of these things are anger. We have roots of bitterness that God's going to deal with this weekend. If those things are in us, they sure talk pretty loud. We're at in our mind, in our heart, in our soul, man, they speak. And so the blood of Jesus speaks mercy. It washes, it cleanses us, it silences the accuser. Hallelujah. And so that's what deliverance does. What deliverance does is it's like, you know, because we're seated with Christ in heavenly places, right? Far above all of that. So when someone gets delivered, it's like the hand of God reaches down and pulls them up out of the warfare realm, the second heaven. He pulls them up out of there. 
a place where they're captured, a place where they're snared by uh, some kind of spirit, right? Some kind of demonic spirit. And that's deliverance is awesome. And so God looses that assignment. That word loose means he dissolves it. He cancels it. It's nullified. It's destroyed because the spirit comes out of you. Amen. And so demons are tormentors of the mind. And so they get, even though they speak in the blood, they, they speak in the mind, you know, but when they get deliverance, they come up out of you, out of the soul realm, but you can feel them in your flesh, right? So the Bible talks about all through Romans, crucifying the flesh, killing the flesh, right? And so they dwell in the flesh. And many times people get free, you know, things are in the organs and whatever area they come in. Many times that's where they'll lodge themselves. And so on this weekend, you will, you will feel them leaving your physical man. Hallelujah. Um, you may feel um, bands being broken off you, chains being released off you. Uh, things that have been uh, wrapped around you will be released or loosed from your physical body. Thank God for Jesus. Amen. And so Jesus did that. He still does it today. And so it says that the word, Jesus Christ, will divide. Because remember, it says it will go down, it will divide, right? It cuts asunder, it destroys, and it uproots the things of darkness that are hidden to the natural eye. And so unless God opens and lifts the veil so we can look into the heart, and he does that many times, you know, through seeing gifts and all of that, deserting of spirits, we can know what's attached to us through those things. But there's many things that are hidden, many things that are hidden from the, the natural sight, but it's not hidden from Jesus. Hallelujah. And so it wouldn't be surprising if you don't have memories, uh, flashbacks, um, even on tonight when you go home, you may have some emotional, um, you may be feeling pretty emotional even through this teaching. That's normal. Because he's going, you're, you're here to get free, so he's going to reveal things that are hidden. He's going to reveal places of trauma. He's going to reveal to you people you need to forgive that you thought you might have, but you really haven't. You know, he's going to show you that, places where you need to release and forgive yourself. Because many times we have resentment and regrets and all of these things toward ourself, those, those things we look back into, and God wants us to uh, put our hand to the plow and not keep looking back there. And so when you do that, you're snared, and you're pulled back into what? A way of feeling, right? And if you continue to feel that way, you're going to begin to do what you feel. And so you can't keep looking back there. Amen. Thank God for freedom. And so the word for iniquity, it's the Hebrew word that means perversity, evil, faulty, mischief, and sin. So the Greek word for iniquity means a violation of the law, a transgression of wickedness, anything. Now, this is different for anyone, isn't it? It's anything that turns us away from God's perfect path. What is it in your life that turns you and steers you away from the path that God has for you, right? Right? And so God will show you what that is. And so thank God that he is, he is revealing these things to his people because he is coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. And so we know that his grace is sufficient. We're going to continue. Like I say, you're going to continue to allow God to perfect you until Jesus comes. And, and just because you're in a level of anointing or you carry a level of authority, he's still going to put his finger on things. He's never going to stop, and we shouldn't desire him to. Amen? We want to be like the king. <laughs> we want to be like Jesus. Amen? That's why we come to church. That's why we, I know we are the church, but that's why we come to these buildings, because we want to look more like the king. Hallelujah. And so Psalm 106.6 says, We have sinned like our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have behaved wickedly. And so you see, he says, we have sinned like our father. So that's why we take on responsibility. We're accountable. We take on responsibility because 
God sees the generations connected. That's how we get good things from our ancestors, too. We inherit good things, too. Come on, we inherit good things and, you know, gifts, different things, mantles, all these things get passed down. But we also inherit the other stuff, the other things. And so um, I'm just going to keep on walking through here. Let's go to, um, let me find one. There's so many scriptures connected to iniquity. Um, let's go to Psalm 51. Let's talk. David understood. He he prayed that God would cleanse him and forgive him. Amen. Yeah, because he had an affair. He sinned against God. And this, this psalm tells us why he did it. In verse 1, it says, Be gracious to me, O God. Psalm 51. He said, According to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions and wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. He's saying, wash me from my perversity, wash me from my evilness, my lawlessness, Father. Cleanse me from my sin. He said, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Now, here, here he says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. He said, in sin, my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in my innermost being, and in the hidden parts, you will make me know wisdom. See, he desires truth in the innermost being. So God doesn't want us to cover up these things, does he? He wants us to understand why we do what we do so we can deal with it. And I love that about God. If there's something in you that maybe your parents or your grandparents never, never knew that was in there, he's chose you to deal with it. See, what I believe whatever he allows you to see that's in your heart, he has given you the grace and the anointing from the Holy Spirit to deal with it. Not to hide it. He gives you the grace, okay? He wants you to eliminate it. He wants you to uproot it out of your lineage. See, you have a responsibility when you know something's in there. You have a responsibility, not your neighbor, not your pastor, not you do. You have a responsibility to confess that. You have a responsibility to, to be able to look at that, not feel shame because we don't want it. We don't want it but we don't want to hide it either. But in church today, there's so many religious masks, isn't there? Yes. Religious spirit, that's probably the biggest familiar spirit in the Western church is religion. And so religion, is, it has a form of godliness, but it has no power. And so sin hides behind the religious mask. People do things out in, in private, but they won't do it in, in, you know, they'll come into the church and act a certain way and be a certain way and be so nice and, and kind and do right. But when they leave the building, right, that's a religious mask. We should be the same everywhere we are. We should be the same at home with our kids, with our spouse, amen, wherever we go in the store. You're in a glass house. The demons know who you are. Come on. And so you have to understand that we can't wear a mask, amen? We can't wear that and fake it because God sees everything, and that's being hypocritical. And Jesus was so hard on the hypocrites, right, because it was a pretender. I'm pretending like I'm okay. I'm pretending like I love them, but I really don't like them, you right? I'm pretending like this. I'm pretending like that, and... And so those are the things, you know, be honest and real when God puts his finger on that. It says, purify me with hyssop, verse 7, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Then he says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. He said, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and sustain 
with, he says, sustain me with a willing spirit. So he's showing you when you get your heart clean, there's a joy. I'm telling you. When you know that thing is dealt with and that thing is out of you, there's a joy and a washing that comes from the presence of the Lord. Amen. So let's go to the New Testament. Let's go to um, James 1, and then we'll go to Mark 9, and we'll just walk quickly tonight. We have much to cover. And so in James chapter 1, In verse 12, it says, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. He said, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. He said, For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. He said, But each one is tempted when he is carried away. And the Amplified says, When he, he is drawn away, enticed, and baited, by his own evil desire, his lust, and his passions. And he says, And when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. And so he says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brother. And so he's saying that that thing is what? Inside of them. It, they, it's in them. It's down in them. And that is the thing. you got to remember that the spirit of iniquity, whatever that lawless act is, whatever that sin nature is, that is what pulls us into the behavior, you see. It is the root issue of all of the fruit that we're bearing as a child of God that's not holy, okay. It's the root issue. And so it could be, you know, it could be numerous things, envy, jealousy, all those things, you know, there is, they're fruits of, of something deeper within. You see what I'm saying? They're a fruit, but there's something deeper within. If, if people have a lot of depression or they're suicide, that is a fruit, but there's something broken. There's something within them, probably in a foundational issue, something in them that needs to be fixed, needs to be dealt with, and that thing uprooted out of them. Thank God for Jesus, Luke. And let's go to Mark 9. See, he wants you whole, right? And so wholeness, when it says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be whole, we know that word means whole in totality of being. So why do we as children of the kingdom, we get a little bit of freedom in this area, but we settle for still carrying around this infirmity? You know, we might get delivered from unforgiveness, but we still have these diseases that are trafficking us. Come on. We should want to be whole in our spirit, soul, and body. But many times in the church, we don't want to work. We don't want to work the word. We don't want to work the kingdom of God. And so, yes, there's miracles and miracles do happen. But many times, God wants you to have what I call self-discovery. He wants you to know why you are like you are. He wants things to be fixed down on the inside of us. And we find, and that's why when we do the cleansing, we usually do the infirmities last because we get rid of all that fear and rejection, all those uh, little imps get out the way. It's like it's rather easy to uproot the diseases and the infirmities and the sicknesses because those, once you get that stuff out of the way, those things come up rather easily. So in Mark 9, this is a really great example of a an iniquity, a curse that was on this child. In Mark chapter 9, when Jesus came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with him. Verse 15, immediately when the entire crowd saw Jesus, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And so he began to ask him, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son possessed with the spirit which makes him mute. He said, whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground. He foams at the mouth. He grinds his teeth and he stiffens out. He said, I told your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do it. And it says, and he answered to them and said, oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. And so they brought the boy to Jesus. And when the boy saw Jesus, okay, immediately in verse 20, the spirit threw him into a convulsion and falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. So you see this would we would call this a seizure. 
today, right? He was having a seizure, a, a deaf and mute spirit, a seizure spirit, and he was manifesting. And so many times, demons will manifest as they leave. And it was, it was Jesus, the anointed one. He was there, and it stirred up the things that were in the boy. And so Jesus was not moved by manifestations. He was never afraid of the devil. Come on. He was never alarmed by what he saw. He was very calm, wasn't he? And it says he asked his father, as this child is manifesting here, he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. So this boy could have been teen or older. I don't know. But he had to live with his dad, right? And it says from childhood, which means from infancy, telling us that from birth, this boy had some issues as a baby. They clearly knew that he, was, he had some kind of curse within him. Now, if it was from infancy and childhood, he didn't do anything to have that. That was in him when he was born, right? He didn't sin, but he was born into sin with some kind of familiar spirit, some kind of curse inside of his uh, soul, in his blood, he said, it has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if he said, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, he's questioning, he's like, all things are possible to him who believes. So me, the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Now, this is where the church is today. That's why much of the church don't even want to touch deliverance, do deliverance. They don't think it's real because the devil has deceived them, right? And that's why a lot of people don't get healed in church because they have spiritual roots. They got, they got demonic spirits that hold back uh, and, and, and keep them from receiving healing. It's so true. And so it says, help my unbelief. And that word unbelief means also disobedience and distrust. So the boy's father was like, I do believe in God. I do believe in you, Jesus, but help my disobedience and my distrust that my child can be saved, that my child can be healed. Mm -hmm. Why? Because he was looking at the issue. It was a big issue right there. We're going to keep reading and see what it does. It says, when Jesus saw a crowd rapidly following, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you to come out of him and do not enter him again. And so in verse 22, I'm going to back up a minute because I missed this very important. It said, it has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. So look at all of that in this whole little text here. And so the demon, this, this spiritual contract on the child, all right, from birth. So whatever they did, the boy was born into it. It was a contract of darkness. It was like a legal contract trying to murder him. The boy wasn't jumping into the fire. The boy wasn't trying to drown himself. It was the assignment of the spirit. And so demons have assignments. They have a will. They have emotions. They have intellect. They have knowledge limited but they do have knowledge and so it was crying out it was doing all of that and the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said he is dead and so jesus took him by the hand and raised him up and he got up and when he came to the house his disciples began questioning him privately why could we not drive it out and he says to them this kind genos g-e-n-o's family kindred spirit um, he said, cannot come out but by anything in prayer and fasting. So it was a stronghold in the bloodline. Generational curse. This generational curse, you know, was deep in there. But Jesus delivered the boy. Then you notice they thought he was dead. So there was a mass exit that came out. He's laying there in peace. <laughs> Can you imagine his whole life struggling with a murdering spirit? Seizures, they're awful, terrible. Uh, what takes place with those, but Jesus delivered him completely of it. Amen. That's what he does. He does that. Praise God. Another scripture in Jeremiah 17, 1 says, iniquity is written on the tablet of the heart with a pen of iron. You can write that down. And so what does that mean? That means it's a scorecard. 
It's written in the, in the heart, the soul. It's in there. And so Galatians 3.13 tells us that Jesus, what? Redeemed us from the curse of the law, becoming a curse for us, right? So when Jesus died on the cross for you, he took every generational curse, iniquity, every stronghold, every spirit, anything that comes against the children of the kingdom, Jesus already defeated it. And so what you do with deliverance is you're just walking out the finished work of Jesus. Amen. You're standing in victory. He's already done it, but you just got to walk through and get that stuff up out of there. You have authority through Christ to do that. Hallelujah. And so God is faithful to his children. He's faithful to do it. So maybe, maybe the enemy has uh, told you that, you know, whatever you're battling, it's been going on for years and, you know, it's never going to go. Well, the devil is a liar. Okay? He's a liar. He's always a liar. And so he speaks to us with lies. And so, see where we're going here. So these strongholds continue on. Let's go to, um, let's talk about the whoredom stronghold tonight a little bit and keep walking through here because I want to get to soul ties and uh, some familiar spirit information. And so uh, whoredom strongholds are real. They're usually a bloodline iniquity. They get passed down. And so you'll see cycles in the family of uh, fornication, which is sex outside of marriage. You see adultery, covenant breaking, right? Uh, all kinds of sexual immorality, pornea, pornography. We'll talk about all those things. And so when that happens, those bring a curse. So I find unclean spirits come in through um, sexual sin, and they also come in through witchcraft. You can have all kinds of, you go to Galatians 5. Um, let's go there. It talks about the works of the flesh. And so how do you know you move from a work of the flesh to a demonic stronghold is because when you have a work of the flesh, it's something you choose to do. You know better. You choose to do it. You repent from it. God washes you right. You try not to do it again. And, and, and you can master that by continue repenting and all of that. But if you continue to sin in an area, that's where a demon can enter. That's where the nature of that becomes a part of your nature. And so in Galatians 5, let's walk there. He said in verse, let's go to 14. He said, the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in one statement. You shall love the Lord your neighbor as yourself. He said, but if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. He said, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. He said, for the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these things are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. He says, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. He said, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, right? He said, immorality, that's your sexual immorality, your impurity and your sensuality. So those things you continue to do that, you get, a, you get that spirit when you continue to sin in an area. Remember, it gets in you, and now that spirit of fornication gets inside of you, and you become a what? A fornicator. It's not just a one-time thing. You begin to, uh, it's easy for you to fall into that. And so it says idolatry, sorcery, enmities, which means hostility and hatred, strife you ever see a hateful person it's awful be around a hateful spirit all the time just hateful that that they have a demon of hatred okay they have a spirit of hatred they're bitter they're angry they have unforgiveness they've been offended and it's no fun being around people like that and so amen right uh strife you ever see uh, somebody that's always in strife they walk in a room and there's a conflict. That's a spirit attached to them. You got to understand, it's the spiritual we're talking about, right? 
jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions. You ever see somebody that just has to debate everything? Argumentative spirit, critical spirit, judgmental spirit. Is either born in them and that nature needs to be crucified, but more than likely it's a spiritual stronghold. Probably grew up under it and it's on them, right? They were in a house like that. Envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He said, but the fruit of the Spirit, this is what God is after in his children. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So if you can operate in that and you can manifest those kind of fruits, that's the fruit of the Spirit. That's what he's after for, with his children, right? Those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So that means if you say you belong to Christ, you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to become like Jesus. You have a responsibility to kill those things. You have a responsibility to be holy, right? To be pure in your sexuality. You have a choice. That's why you got to get that stuff out of there. You got to ask God to clean that stuff out. We do cleansing on children, and children can have a spirit of fornication, and they've never had any sexual relationships because they were born in fornication. Come on. They were born into some things, and so it's very true. So you need to break uh, curses while they're little. Break those things while they're little so as they grow and their bodies, come on, begin to grow, that spirit of fornication will not lure them into sin. Remember, James said it's what's within us. That's why most of us probably in the room fell into some sin. It was in us. We were born into it. But God cleanses us from all sin and all iniquity. Amen? So we can do that. And if you've had a history of addictions or any of those kind of things and you've had children, you need to deal with that while they're little. You need to deal with it. You know, we sometimes, you know, people make little jokes. Oh, they're, that's a stubborn little child. Get that spirit of stubbornness out of them, right? You know, that, that little one, oh, they, they got a little temper in there. And they, we just laugh. It's not funny because the demon uses that body. And he uses that body to the degree of that understanding of the child. But as the child grows up, that anger gets uglier. And the child gets more violent. And the child could end up in prison because of the anger inside of them, right? And so I'm telling you, they will use whatever they can get into uh, to bring evil and destruction. That's their assignment is to what? Still kill and destroy. And so you'll see that in your book. All of these sexual uh, bondages and sin, demonic traffic and marriage, and so if you're married and, and your spouse is, has a lot of issues with uh, any kind of, even if it's um, for, uh, masturbation, come on. We don't like to talk about that stuff. But all those sexual uncleanness, it affects the spouse, okay? It will affect them. And so pornography, pornea, fornication is, is a spirit. And so pornea gets into the eye gate, down into the, it's a demon, so it gets into the imagination and it stays in there. And so those images get cast out. We have to cast out images because they, are, they get seared in, locked into, uh, into the brain, into the mind. Those things are real. Thank God for Jesus. So he cleanses our imaginations. That's the same way with trauma, post-traumatic stress images. Those are images, right? Well, trauma, fear, that's an image. Fear is a spirit. And so there's a lot of things in people that is from trauma and, and, and sexual uncleanness, all of those images. God will deliver people in their imaginations, okay? He calls out those things, the images that are seared in the heart or in the mind because it causes the body to, to react when they come up. And, you know, there's different triggers and different things that cause people to, um, to experience that. Whatever that is. So when they experience the image flashes, there's a reaction in the body, isn't there? Yes, there is. There's a reaction in your emotions, all of those things. And so God, he heals the whole man. 
Amen. He heals the whole man. He's, he's, he does that. He heals the whole man. Hallelujah. And so um, let's talk about familiar spirits a little bit here. You won't have that in there either, I don't think. But it's very important because we're going to talk about soul ties. And so soul ties are very, very real. And so through soul ties, you can experience a lot of, if it's, a, if it's an intimate soul tie, you can experience a lot of uh, sexual uh, strongholds and spirits that can enter in through the soul tie. And so there's a lot of um, not just sicknesses that can come in because when two come together, they become one, but you can have uh, tormenting dreams, you can have uh, illegal marriages and all kinds of things that take place in the realm of the spirit with these things. And so when you're talking about soul ties, let's go. Um, what page is that in your foundation book? Has anybody got it? Twelve. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Was that Renee? Okay. Carrie, thank you. <laughs> so verse 12, soul ties. Psalm 23, 3. This is where a lot of those familiar spirits will come in too. It says, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And so the term soul or heart pertains to the mind, the will, the emotions. The term tie means to be knit or bound together. So after an intimate sexual relationship occurs, there is a binding together of the souls and the hearts. The soul tie is a term that we use to describe areas of our soul that get tied together through sinful or intimate relationship. So soul ties will lead us into captivity or bondage to the, to the whom we gave our soul to, or it can bind us to a healthy relationship, a godly covenant friendship, um, a life-giving bond, right? And so the, those with deep soul ties within them, is, is it, we could say they have the spirit of that person within them. Genesis 2.24 says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So Jesus again quotes this in Matthew 19, 4 through 6. So the Greek word for join means a joining in flesh and body. So this is a spiritual union. Amen? It's a meshing together, creating a tie or a bond. And so the breaking of a soul tie and calling out the spirit of a person would be best described because it sounds really bizarre when you first hear that, but it's like calling out the influence, the nature, the spiritual part of the person because Jesus says you become one. And so that's what happens when people get delivered from soul ties, that nature, that control that that, that soul tie had over you, right? So there's control, there's all kinds of things. It gets called out of them. And if you got a, a sickness, an infirmity, a disease, uh, that happens, right? STDs, I believe that all comes in through what? The curse of fornication. And, and so that can come out. God can deliver people from that. Fornication, adultery, uh, Satan binds us in illegal marriages. When we're calling out soul ties out of people, people will see the face of the person. I may not say the name. But they see the face or they feel the presence of that person. See, it's spiritual. You have to, it's just a spiritual uh, issue here. And so they'll see, the, they'll feel, they'll see all of that. Even the emotions attached to the person, right? All of that that's connected to that joining and becoming one when God breaks it, he, he comes, he severs it because it's not life-giving, right? It's not life-giving at all. And so he'll cut it, he'll sever it, and whatever came in through it has to go in the name of Jesus. Amen. And so they may feel them as if they walked into the room, but they're not present. They can be thinking about the other and reach out at the same time, all of that can go on through soul ties. People can project themselves on you. That's real, okay? Witchcraft, all of those things can work through a soul tie. And so I'm going to go into my other book, but I just wanted to pull that out of yours. And so 
Thank God that he's able to cut them. So even as we talk about uh, soul ties, okay, it can be through uh, bloodline curses. These are negative ones. Uh, rape and molestation. Many people are still soul tied to their abuser. People have trauma bonds. People can be, um, that's how you see women that have been abused many times. And I know men can go back to their abusers. Come on, either way. But they'll go back to the abuser because they have this trauma bond. It's, I'm not teaching trauma tonight, but it's very real, right? And so it's a spiritual thing. It's, it, it pulls them back into that. And those of us who see it will be like, I can't believe they will go back to that person. Are they crazy? No, they got a soul tie. They got a trauma bond. They're, they're joined to them. They can't help it. Even though they could say, I'm never going back to them. I, you know, I hate that person. Next thing you know, give them a week, maybe two weeks, you know, and they're right back in this relationship that's toxic, that's damaging, right, because their soul tied to them. Um, fornication, adultery, homosexuality, all of that is under fornication, Physical and emotional ties, domination, witchcraft, control, trauma bonds, grief, soul ties of loved ones. People have those. You know, they'll share someone that died in their life, a loved one, and they talk about it like it happened last week when it's been, you know, 25 years ago. That's something wrong with that, right? And so that needs to be broken because I'm telling you, grief and all of those things when you have those ties, that tie or that binding that you have with them, vows you have made. Some people feel if they give up the grief, that they'll forget the person. You know, they'll forget what they had, and we're going to talk about that. They'll forget all those things, and so they, they punish themselves, and they hang on to the grief or what was or what could have been and all of those things, and you've got to cut that. You've got to cut those things off because they do not bring life to you. Um, so soul ties or the loss of, it brings a loss of soul, which includes um, areas of idolatry, whoredoms, witchcraft, magic, intoxication, drugs, alcohol. All of these areas are a loss of your mind, okay, your soul, your mind, and so when, when these things happen, just like, you know, an alcoholic, they'll say, you know, they're burning brain cells or, you know, people that have been on drugs, they're fractured and their mind is just everywhere and it's held in a realm of a spirit and then unclean spirits come in whenever there's a void, that's where the spirit comes in and sets up in their heart, in their mind. And that's how people are forgetful. They can't focus. They get... All of these issues in the mind, forgetfulness, fogginess, they can't concentrate, they can't rest, they can't sleep. People say, I don't know who I am. I don't know where I'm going. Why? Because they're, they're just everywhere. And so when you, when you have these soul ties and, you, and you, you, you really do, it is a loss of mind, okay? But thank God he restores the soul. That's what restoration means, right? Except he doesn't just restore it, but he makes it better. <laughs> it's better than it was. Amen? So he puts us back together. He binds us back together whenever we repent and come out of agreement with these things. And so various unclean spirits can now travel or oppress the individual with these ties. These ties can affect your emotions spiritually and your physical state as well. This oppression can make it difficult for one to make decisions on their own due to the other's influence upon them. You know when you're soul tied and you can't make your own decisions. You try and make a decision and you will think about the person you're soul tied to. What are they going to think about that? How would they want me to react? How would they want me to respond? How should I answer that? And you think about your the person that you're soul tied to, you're not using your own mind, right? You're making decisions and choices based on this relationship that's probably controlling. It's true. That's how you see a lot with parent and children, ungodly relationships. A child's grown, they've grown up now. They're not, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old. They're an adult. But because they have a controlling parent, 
that will project their soul on them. <laughs> they won't do the things they desire to do because they still want to please their parent. You got to cut that. You're, done. You're grown now, right? You got to cut it. Cut the strings. Cut the cord. Everybody's laughing, so we got to do that this weekend. We got to cut some things because <laughs> we don't want to make them unhappy. Who are you trying to please? Because <laughs> we have to please God. In a healthy relationship, a parent should want their child to find their way. Right? You should want them to find their way with the Lord. Amen. So you need to think about that. Okay? You have your child for a season, and that, and that child belongs to God anyway. You're a steward. As a child of God, everything you have, you're stewarding it. You're a steward. Those, those are gifts from God, but from God, they belong to God. Amen? They belong to God. They're not yours. They're yours to steward. You enjoy the gift. You gave them back to God, so you have to release that. And, yes, they're going to make some decisions that you wouldn't make and you wouldn't like, but you got to trust God that he's going to walk them through that. Amen? And you pray for them, but you don't manipulate them. You should never make your child feel guilty hmm, or anybody. So guilt, making people feel guilty or condemned, all of that stuff that's manipulating people, that's all works of uh, spiritual charismatic witchcraft that goes on in the church, okay? We'll talk about that tomorrow, but that's real. And so thank God he's helping us. He's helping us. And don't try and live your child's life because, you know, you made some mistakes, so you want to live your child's life and dictate what they do, what they become, where they go, how they look. Come on. You can't do that because that's controlling your child. Amen. I'm, and I say child, I'm talking about when they get out the house. Come on. Because you are a parent first. You're a parent first. I, you know, if you've been a parent, you still see your kids sometimes as children, right? But they're adults now, right? And so you have to release them to the Lord. Amen. God is good. And you get so free when you do that. Yeah, you get so free because that's a, that's a new season for you. It's a new season for you. And so all of those things. Um, so, let's, so the word familiar, let's talk about familiar spirits and soul ties. So the word familiar means to be uh, well acquainted, thoroughly conversant, to be familiar with a subject, easygoing. Now we're talking about the spiritually, right? So familiar spirit, familiar it means unconstrained or closely intimate or personal. A familiar friend to be on familiar terms. So familiar spirit can keep us in bondage to soul ties. So I'm going to talk about that. The word familiar comes from the Latin word meaning household servant. It's a spirit or a demon that serves or prompts an individual a demon that obeys a witch or sorcerer. And so tomorrow we'll probably get into that part of it. But familiar spirits are also passed down in families through generations in culture. To stay free sometimes, I want you to hear me, not all the time. Sometimes you may need to remove yourself from the person, from the church body. Wow. Or a territory where you were in bondage. Let me explain that. Because say, say you get delivered from a Jezebel soul tie, religious spirits in a church. Come on. You get, you, get, you get freedom from those demons. And after you get free, you just go right back up and sit the next Sunday in the same church that you had to get deliverance from. So what does that do? The familiar spirits that you were friendly, familiar, that were a part of your life that you got free from, when you set back in there, they're around you. They're probably in the pulpit or in the pew. Come on. They're there. And so I'm telling you, you need to seek the Lord about that. It's very hard to stay clean when you go sit in dirty places, isn't it? It's very, very hard to stay clean. 
Same way, because we get a lot of church stuff. Same way in a church or if, in a, just same way in the world. If you get uh, delivered from uh, drug addiction, but you don't uh, cut off your, uh, you know, your, your homie, as they say. You know, you don't cut them off. You still go back out there and you hang with them. Familiar spirits are going to get you, okay? They already know you, they got cast out. They are not happy. And so they will lure you, they will tempt you, they will work to wear you down in your soul to get you to fall back into the same sin. And when you fall back into the same sin, we don't know when, but seven more is coming, okay? I don't know when that is, but it's real. And the last state, Jesus said, is worse than the first, right? He said, that is how it is with this evil generation. What he was saying was, they didn't stay holy. Because mm-hmm. when you're, getting, you're coming to get deliverance, you want to live holy in that area. Or you wouldn't be in there getting deliverance, right? But when you go back into wickedness, he says, guess what's going to happen? More is coming back in. Because they invite friends. And you can, it's all in the Bible. Come on. And so to stay free, sometimes you got to remove yourself for a season, for a time, or maybe God will move you to a new location. We see God do that. It's very beneficial because they need to stay free a long time. (laughs) They need to get built up in their spirit, man. Amen. They need to be secure in who they are in Christ and learn their authority and all of those things. Your, Your life, come on, is worth it. And so this will strengthen you to not return to the old relationship places or things that demons were attached to. So demons are attached to persons, places, and things. They're attached maybe to jewelry, to gifts. Come on. All those things. So even when you're breaking, that's not in your book, but even though you're breaking those soul ties, okay, you're, you're severing those things. To say if you had, um, you got some gifts, you know, from somebody you were soul tied to, and you get deliverance from them, but every time you uh, see that gift, or you wear that necklace, or you wear the ring, come on, your your soul, the familiar spirits that are attached, the reason why there's familiar spirits attached is because it was an ungodly relationship. There was some vows made with that jewelry or that ring. There was some promises that were made, you see, And so remember, you have to see these things as spiritual, right? So you need to get rid of those things because it will pull your soul. Old relationships are bound by strongholds, will bring up memories. When you get around the person, place, this can be a familiar spirit operating. Refuse to listen to it. You know, um, you could get free in an area, but when you say you go back to visit, you drive through that region, all of a sudden, you get some thoughts, right? You, you may have been, uh, you had a place, a city where you did a lot of darkness. You did a lot of things. And you're fine as long as you're in another county. Come on. But then you go over there to that city or that place, and you're just driving through there. What happens to your mind? You can be enticed. You can be baited. All of a sudden, you're just reminiscing. Oh, that's the devil is a liar. There ain't nothing good back there. He's lying to you. And he tries to pick out the the good things. You think it's good. It's not good because it was based on a lie. It was based on debauchery. It was based on sin. What is good in that? Nothing. So the devil, you see what he does, though? That's an entire familiar spirit. Witchcraft spirit. They're familiar, they entice, and they pull you back into your old behavior. You can see that. I can see that when people get free and they're doing good for a while. I know when familiar spirits are working because I start to see some old habits. or I, Not habits, but some old ways of thinking. Maybe an old attitude. I hadn't seen that in a while. All of a sudden, they got this, this, this attitude that they had when they came in, but they've been free for a long time, and all of a sudden, the attitude's back. Who's been talking to them? A familiar spirit. Mm-hmm. Probably in somebody or through a text. 
or in the imagination because they have not learned to cast down those things. See, they submit to God, right? Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But if you entertain it in your soul, I'm telling you, it's going to change your demeanor. You see it all the time doing this kind of stuff. You see people's demeanor begin to change, their attitude. You know, they get start getting pulled, start feeling agitated. Something's going on because that familiar spirit's trying to pull you back. And so you have to be aware of old waste places or places of death that is associated with the stronghold. Your old stomping grounds of sin. You must become stronger. You need to get that place healed inside of you. Inner healing is needed, deliverance, all of these things before being uh, around these places to ensure spiritual safety. If you do not get healed in the soul, okay, familiar spirits will have power to lure you back into the same relationship again. That's why when you're getting healing, sometimes it's progressive, isn't it? Sometimes people get it quicker than other people, but it depends on the person. It depends on what they've been through. It depends on the level of sin behavior, what kind of demons control them. There's different levels of darkness. Come on. Different levels of darkness, different bloodlines, different things. And so familiar spirits cause cycles of dysfunction. They desire to fill your soul again. Remember, they've been cast out but they want to feel it again. They want to come back in. because so, so when an unclean spirit leaves a person, Jesus said it roams around in dry places seeking rest. It rested inside the house. Who is the house? You, your bloodline. So when you see house in the Bible, it's generations. Mm -hmm. It rested in the generations, in the blood. It was secure. It liked it in there. It's easy for familiar spirit to operate in people because it knows you. And it knew. It, it knew how to hook people in, in the generations. And it knows you. It knows your buttons. It knows it studied you. Come on. Knows your weaknesses and your strengths, too. And so you need time to heal by renewing your mind in the word of God, being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's so important in understanding truth, which is God's word. So people need to take time uh, to truly heal and not enter another relationship. How many times you see people rebound into another relationship? They get delivered. They get healed of this relationship. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. And, and then boom, they're in another one. And most of the time, if they're not, well, all the time, if they're not healed, they end up with the same relationship they came out of. And they don't even know. It all looked good. <laughs> it felt right at first. Give it some time because it's a familiar spirit that came in and pulled you into the same cycle. And so you need to take time, make sure you're healed. Let Jesus fill your soul. Give him everything, right? Become one with him. A sure sign that you are not healed in the soul is when you rebound quickly into another relationship, which will soon prove to be like the last. It is like trying to bring new furniture into the room when it's still, of the old, when it's still full of the old stuff. Where are you going to fit it, right? It's the same principle right there. Hebrews 12, 1 says, to lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us. You need time to find out who you are in Christ. Amen. You got to figure out who you are with Jesus. So also, this is very important. You got to beware of sympathetic witchcraft, of false compassion with old relationships, right? So you got to remember the cost of the toxic relationship. Doesn't mean you're angry anymore. You've been delivered. But when a familiar spirit comes and says, well, you know, Johnny, Johnny was so nice. He bought me flowers. But yet Johnny beat me up. Come on. That's the truth, isn't it? It's the truth. Think about that. So familiar spirits will try to remind you of the good things but not recall the thief that stole your goods, stole your peace, tried to take your life, took your health, your self-esteem, and your money. 
right? Think about drug addictions, all those things. It stole your money. It stole your peace, your health, everything with the abuse and the addictions that are associated with the tie of that relationship. Serious, isn't it? To see sympathetic witchcraft is what it is. The familiar spirit tries to just paint you the picture of the good old days, the good things. He's lying to you. You have a choice to believe him or not. He's a liar. So the familiar spirit of religion mm, keeps us chained to others of like spirit. People with this spirit will do things in the name of Jesus, but they are not yoked to him. All right? That's that form of godliness, the apostate. It's a form of godliness, but they have no power. They don't act like him or nothing. And, and it's a familiar spirit of religion. You must look at the fruit of these relationships or churches you attend. What kind of fruit is growing? Hallelujah. Even in the land uh, or the region we live, Familiar spirits will resist us when we try to leave it or follow Holy Spirit. That's real. Mm -hmm. And so it'll try and resist you because that familiarity, that's why you hear sometimes small town thinking, right? They stay stuck in small town thinking. Why? Because there's familiar spirits assigned to them that keep them stuck right there. There are people that will never leave their town for fear or whatever reason. They stay right there in the same place. They only shop there. They, they could get an opportunity to go to school. They could have an opportunity to, you know, God can lay something out for them and tell them, but a familiar spirit will keep them chained there. That's why most of the time when you see people that have left a region or left a land or a state, they're pioneers. <laughs> they had to press past the familiar spirits to get out. Come on. And I'm not saying it's wrong to live in the same place. Come on. I'm not judging people. But I want you to understand me by the spirit how these work, right? You will have an opportunity or something that God, I'm talking about when God speaks to you. So if God speaks to you and shows you something, but you're bound somewhere, God is a God of liberty. Hallelujah. Freedom. He doesn't bind us. He doesn't, he doesn't control us, does he? There's no fear in perfect love of God. Amen. And so they'll try and hold you there physically and hinder you from healthy spiritual growth as God desires. They will try to distract you from, un, from fulfilling your purpose um, talking you out of the necessary changes that bring new life. They will work to get you to disobey Jesus. I think about Abram in Genesis 12. God told him to leave his family. <laughs> right? He said leave them. If you read Genesis 12, you'll see God blessed him and all of that. But he had to leave his father's house. He had to leave his father's way of thinking. Mm -hmm. He had to come out of that. His father was an idolater, but God chose him to be the father of faith. Now, if Abram could have denied and stayed in a comfortable place in his father's house, he was a wealthy man. He had a, he had a natural inheritance I'm sure he would have received, but he left everything and allowed God to bless his life. And so there's many of us, because of familiar spirits, we are bound in a mindset of our ancestors. We're bound in a mindset of relatives. Come on. We're bound to a way of thinking, you know. And when, so when God says you've got to leave your father's house, I'm not always speaking of a geographical location. Although there's times he does that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's times he has to even release people for a season out of their familiarity so he can do something with them. Because it's so strong there that he can't work with them because of the, the chains. But when they get out of that area, then he can begin to change their mindset because the familiar spirits aren't hammering them and, and picking on them and, and, and controlling them like they did in that place. Mm-hmm, it's true. 
You can go back to areas where you used to live and you feel some stuff. Or you get around your family before you heal. Some of us, biological family, you get around them. What happens? They pull on your soul. Soul ties. They pull on your soul strings. You love them too. And so when, when God is, is, is changing you many times, you've got you to pay attention to that. You've got to pay attention to that when, they tr- when those things try and hold you back. And so when you find yourself stuck with spirit, without spiritual growth or if you, if you gravitate back to old attitudes and sin behaviors, you most likely have been snared by spirits of familiarity. Do not be deceived, 1 Corinthians 5.33, what? Bad company corrupts good morals. It's true, isn't it? It's so true, y'all. So you need to look at that. And so remember, God wants to take you out of your earthly father's house. Come on. Think about it spiritually here. Out of that way of thinking, out of every, um, every box that you have been put in. Mm-hmm. And he wants you to excel past that into the will and the purposes of the kingdom. There's people that are grown that are still under the thumb they could be 30 40 50 years old and still under the thumb of the training or the teaching or of all those things of of a parent or grandparent and they stay right there there's people that will not even purchase something for their home if their parent don't like it i'm talking about styles of furniture i'm talking about certain types of cars come on some of y'all know i'm talking about you won't do it because you know it'll be unpleasing. All of those things, this sounds funny. That's a familiar spirit, y'all. You have to see it for what it is. You're created unique. Mm-hmm. You don't have the same thumbprint as your mama and your daddy. You don't have the same fingerprint, right? You may have gotten some things, but God created you unique. Hallelujah. You're uniquely created, so you do not have to stay trapped in a box. You should always walk in love. Come on. You should always walk in love, but you need to understand that. So you need to always be challenged. Without a challenge, there is no change. We challenge people in here sometimes. We'll tell them to sit in a different place in church. When you come into the building, don't sit where you always sit. That's funny, isn't it? But it's simple, but it's true, isn't it? We gravitate. Look at that. We gravitate to what is familiar to us. It, and familiar makes them comfortable being familiar with that. It's easy. There is no challenge. There's no stretching. But God wants to renew us. He wants us to follow him, right? And so are you renewing your mind? Some questions to ask. Are you renewing your mind with the word of God into a new action? After this cleansing, there should be a new action. Mm -hmm. There should be some change behaviors and some insight here. Are your relationships positive and pulling you upwards toward Christ? Or do you have relationships that pull you out of fellowship with Jesus? Do you have relationships that make you angry? Hope prayerfully you forgive. You have relationships that pull you into certain ways of thinking that you know is not good. You Remember, we're, we're talking about a new action, right? Are you challenging your flesh to obey Jesus? After this weekend, I pray that there is a roar inside of you where you make your flesh obey the Lord. Mm-hmm. And you begin to rise up in that authority. Are you operating in new dimensions of faith? See, familiar spirits will keep you on the same level forever. They're going to let you excel. They're not going to, they're going to, remember, they work to keep you bound. They, they're the ones speaking to you saying, you know you can't, you can't go to college, or you know you can't this and you can't that. You know you're no good at that. that that's a familiar spirit speaking to keep you bound and shackled at the same level of faith you are right now. They don't want you going past their boundaries, right? They don't want you knowing who Christ is in you. They don't want you to understand your authority in Jesus. They don't want you to walk in the things that God has for you. They'll hinder you. So you need to look at it. Look at, even on tonight as we're finishing up here, look at the things that have hindered you. Write those things down. Wrong self-image, more than likely. 
You know, we know there's rejection, there's fear. We'll deal with all those fears. But maybe word curses someone has spoken to you, told you couldn't do it. That's a big one. People hear, I can't. You know, I can't do it, or you can't do it, or you're not this, and you're not that. And then we, u- we allow those things to use the sight factor to get us to disbelieve God. Well, you know you don't have what it takes, and you don't have no resources, and you don't have no this and that. That's coming out of that realm. That's, God says all things are possible, right, to those who believe. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is a God that makes a way. He's a God that, that opens the door. He's the way maker. We sing that song. We sing it, but do we believe it? And so this is good homework for you tonight. You need to write down the things that hindered you, things that are hindering you, things that lie to you, right? The devil speaks to you through lies. He's the father of lies. There is no truth in him. So when you know the enemy is speaking, it's going to be negative, it's going to be hateful, it's going to be unbelief, doubt, fear. That's the voice of the stranger, right? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and a stranger's voice they will not follow. So you are not to follow the voice of fear. You are not to follow the voice of rejection. You are not to follow those evil voices, right? Because you know the voice of God and he speaks through love, (laughs) He speaks to encouragement. He speaks to peace. I always know when he's talking because I'll have a peace. Even if there's chaos around me, if I have peace in my spirit, I know it's him. Shalom, peace, right? And so there's some homework tonight. Anybody that you need to forgive, you need to write out some uh, notes or letters to them, not to give them, but for you and the Lord. People that you're angry with. People you have unforgiveness and will go in depth. And even before you leave tonight, you need to release them from your lips. You need to release them. But we'll talk about the snare um, of offense tomorrow and all of those things because you need to forgive in order to receive what God has for you fully. You don't want anything hindering you. So write some letters to people you need to release. Amen. And if you've done that, some of you might still be holding on to some things in your own heart about yourself. If you know there's some familiar spirits that you're still wrestling with, you need to write them down. And you'll know the Holy Spirit's going to show you after this message. He's going to show you what it is. And so any familiar spirits, you know, different cultures have different strongholds. It's true because in every bloodline, there's some strongholds. There's some principalities and powers that are assigned to different ethnics, different people groups. It's real. And so out of that, there will be a nature. There will be certain things that, that go on in there. So you need to write those down tonight and ask the Holy Spirit to show you. Amen? God, God is good, isn't he? He's working. He's speaking. Yes. And so maybe you're in a relationship where you have a soul tie. You can't, you know, you're married to him, right? Well, you need to, you need to get free of the unforgiveness, the bitterness, or whatever it is. Whatever is controlling you you still can get freedom from that control. Because remember, it's spiritual. You still can get free and live above that and be in that relationship. (laughs) Through Christ, you can do it. And and, And when you do that, that will give you the grace to pray effectively for them. Because you can't pray for anybody when you have offense, unforgiveness, and you're broken. So you let God heal you, and then you can rise up in your authority and speak into that from up here instead of being down here in the warfare. And so there is a place for children of the kingdom to live and to dwell, and that is above the warfare, not in it. And so when I have bondage, I'm living in it. But when I get free, I rise above it, and I can speak into it because we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's why you need a strong support group. That's why you need power of agreement and prayer. That's why you need to keep feeding your, feeding your spirit man truth so you can learn how to stay up here and not to get down here, right? We're not to be entangled. He, he wrote about it. Don't be entangled in those things. Amen.